Take your Bibles and open them to Deuteronomy. We are in a series. Chris, thank you wherever you went. Thank you. Appreciate that. We are in a series on 66 books, and we are on book five. We are finishing out the Pentateuch tonight, and um, long ago, in another millennium, when I graduated from seminary, and I went to my first church, and I was a youth pastor. Mike Jones was in my youth ministry, by the way, and so was Zach Can, just so you know. And if you ever want to know stories about that, I can tell you later. But I had a, a pastor tell me um, when I was starting to preach, he said, I was like, there's just so much, to, I can't say it all. And he was like, he was just he always had these little pithy statements, and he said, every good sculptor has to leave good marble on the floor. And uh, when you try to preach a whole book, you're leaving a mountain of marble on the floor. And uh, I just want to encourage you to be merciful to the men who come up here to try to preach in one message any one of these books of the Bible, uh, because it is very difficult work to do. But what I would like to do tonight, as we are finishing out the Pentateuch and dealing with Deuteronomy, I want to review first um, just a little bit about the Pentateuch and talk about it as a whole. And then we will go in number two into Deuteronomy. And then at the end, we'll do some application from that. So let's just review some basic things about the Pentateuch. We're talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? These are the five books. Uh, Pentateuch means five scrolls. Uh, it's known variously, this section, as the law, the law of Moses, the Torah. Uh, and the broad purpose of these first five books of the Old Testament are not to thwart your Bible reading plan at the beginning of each year. But these five books, the broad purpose is that the second generation of Israelites who came out of the Exodus in Egypt, they needed to know two things primarily. They needed to know who Yahweh is, and they needed to know who they were as a nation in unique relationship to him. Yahweh is their creator. He is their redeemer, redeemed them out of slavery. He is their sustainer in the wilderness. He is their Lord. He is their judge of the descendants of Abraham. And Israel proves themselves to be just as sinful as the rest of the nations. Israel is not unique. Israel is not a better people than another set of people. But they have become the object of Yahweh's covenant love by grace, and they need to know that. And the benefit for all of us who read the Pentateuch is we get to, as we put our eyes on Israel and see them as they truly are, we gain insight actually into ourselves, don't we? Because their problem is not a Jewish problem. It's not an ethnic problem. It, it's, a, it's a heart problem that we also have. And in the Pentateuch, we quickly gain foundational understandings of who God is, creation. We gain insight into who man is and what a man is like. We gain insight into sin in these first five books of the Bible. We gain insight into why the earth looks the way that it does today. We gain insight into the fact of judgment, the origins of nations, languages, and cultures. Why do we have those? Well, the first five books tell you about that, first book in particular. And God's hope for sinful man through the shed blood of an innocent substitute. Listen, that is not a New Testament idea. That's not where the root of that is. It's found back in Genesis. All right? So these first five books help us gain insight that God has hope for us through this um, shed blood of an innocent substitute. Now, that gets very fleshed out in Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Um, there's clear continuity Letter D, throughout the Pentateuch. From one book to the next in the Pentateuch, there's clear continuity of content, of theme, purpose, style. Each book is the sequel to the one right in front of it. And there's this inseparableness to it, this interdependent relationship that all five books have on one another. The author, letter E, of the Pentateuch is Moses. And it was written uh, between 1445 in 1405 BC. Numbers and Deuteronomy were written in the last year, 1405 of Moses' life, because both of them contain information regarding Moses' last year of life. 
And finally, just in review of, Pentateuch, of the Pentateuch, letter F, the Pentateuch's important place at the beginning of the Bible. We've already been talking about it a little bit here. But the Pentateuch, and especially Deuteronomy, uh, the Pentateuch lays the foundation, not just for the next section of your Old Testament, the historical books, the 12 books from Joshua to Esther, but the Pentateuch lays the foundation really for the whole rest of the Old Testament in all of the Bible, including the New Testament. There are roots in the Pentateuch that have fruits beyond the Pentateuch, and we're going to kind of get to that a little bit later. But that's why the Pentateuch is there at the beginning. It is a massive foundation underneath the rest of your Bible. Okay. Now let's talk about Deuteronomy, the fifth book of that Pentateuch. Let's talk about the author. Obviously, it's still Moses. Moses is 120 years old at the time of writing. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 1 and 2. By the way, these notes that are up there um, are all on, um, my notes that I'm actually teaching from are on the website. So if you want to listen more tonight and not try to write everything down, you, you can do that and then just um, download the, the PDF off the website later if you want. Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 and 2. Here's what Moses says, or it says, Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. Uh, he's 120 years as he writes this. It's 1405 B.C., um, Deuteronomy 32, verse 48 to the end is most likely written by Joshua. It gives the account of Moses' death. And so most think that Joshua penned the last part of Deuteronomy. What's the setting, letter C, what's the setting of Deuteronomy? Um, the setting is God's judgment of the first generation of Israelites that came out of the Exodus or out of Egypt in the Exodus. That judgment is over. The first generation has died in the wilderness, except for Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. We talked about, um, I think Ben mentioned last week, there's probably in an order of 90 funerals a day for about 38, 39 years. That's what they would have been doing over and over, burying, 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 and doing it again and again and again. And that has all come to an end in the second generation of Israelites who are now all grown up. They are encamped on the east side of the Jordan River on the plains of Moab. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5, or I'm sorry, 1, 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Here's the setting. These are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arabah opposite Suf between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. It is 11 days journey from Horeb, by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Uh, what could have been an 11-day journey when they left the mountain and gone into the land ended up being 40 years total. Now it happened in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that Yahweh had commanded him to give them. Verse 4, after he had struck down Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth and Edre, Across the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law. So, the east side of the Jordan has already been conquered. Those kings are wiped out, and Jericho and the land of promise, the land of Canaan, lay open to invasion now. And the recipients, letter D, the recipients are, again, this second generation of Israelites. That's who Moses is writing to primarily. Their rebellious parents refused to believe Yahweh and enter into the land, right? Numbers chapter 13 and 14. But God promised to care for their children and lead that second generation successfully into the land of promise. Let's go back to Numbers 14 just for a moment. Turn there quickly to chapter 14, verse 31, and take a look at this. They had said, oh, we can't go into the land. If we do, our, our little ones are going to be dead and, you know, we can't go in. And here's what God said in response to that. Numbers 14, verse 31. Your little ones, however, who you said would become plunder, I will bring them in, Yahweh said, so that they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness. 
and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpse has come to an end in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt a year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition. I, Yahweh, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall come to an end, and there they will die. And they indeed did die, and now this second generation will be the one to enter the land and conquer it with Joshua and receive the land that was promised by Yahweh to Abraham. What's the purpose of Deuteronomy? As the last book in Moses' last year of his life, he doesn't get to go in. What's the purpose of this book? Um, I got a statement for you up there. You can see it's These are Moses' farewell sermons. Now, what do these farewell sermons do? They, they explain the, the law of Yahweh, and they provide the standard for faith and for living. So Israel was to look at this law, and it, as it is explained to them and taught to them, they would see the standard for what they must believe and how they must live. It's calling Israel to be loyal to Yahweh so that they can live to the fullest under his blessing in the land forever. God has a huge plan with this nation on a plot of real estate on a sin-cursed world. And he wants to put something really unique on display. And Deuteronomy is Moses' last set of sermons to be able to help them understand this law. So this is not law for law's sake. Moses is expounding it, he's making it clear, he's making it distinct, he's making it plain. The second generation needed that clearest exposition of the law so that they could have the fullest understanding of what God required of them, which would then position them best to live faithfully under it. So this is not law for law's sake. These regulations were given so that Israel could experience the deepest enjoyment of God's blessings that he promised them in the Abrahamic covenant in the land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8 for a moment. See, I have given over the land before you. Go in and possess the land which Yahweh swore. Sorry, I'm trying to move this out of the way so I don't give you another one of those explosions. See, I've given over the land before you. Go in and possess the land which Yahweh swore to give to your fathers. What, what fathers are you talking about? Well, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to them and to their seed after them. So there's a promise that precedes everything that's going on in Deuteronomy. Now turn over to chapter 7, verse 12, and watch this. Chapter 7, verse 12. We're talking about this law that's not law for law's sake. But watch what this law is supposed to do. Verse 12 of chapter 7. Then it will be because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them that Yahweh your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your who? Fathers. Who's he talking about? Those same fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will love you, and he will bless you, and multiply you, and he will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine and your oil and increase of your herd and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There will be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And Yahweh will take away from you all sickness. He will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but he will give them to all who hate you. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. This is the language of Abrahamic covenant. So this is not law for law's sake. It is so that they can have the deepest enjoyment of the Abrahamic covenant by being faithful in this Mosaic covenant. Here's an outline for you. You can see it. There's the setting in verses 1 1 to 4. Sermon 1 is in chapter 1 through chapter 4. Sermon 2 is in chapter 4 into all the way to chapter 28, verse 68. There's a third sermon, chapter 29 and 30. That's where um, the covenant with Yahweh is renewed with that second generation of Israelites on the plains of Moab. And then there's the conclusion that we believe that Joshua um, wrote the, the majority of that. What about reading Deuteronomy? Have you ever read Deuteronomy in one sitting? 
<laughs> the, the looks on your faces are great. Like, why would I do that? <laughs> do you think you could? Do you know how long it would take you to read Deuteronomy in one sitting? It would take you about two hours and 24 minutes. Now, in your heart, raise your hand, not out loud, not in front of everybody. Have you ever seen Shawshank Redemption? Have you ever seen Forrest Gump? Have you ever in one sitting watched Castaway? I don't know why two out of those three have Tom Hanks in them, but if you can sit for two hours and 24 minutes and watch a movie, that's what it's going to require you if if you were going to read Deuteronomy in one sitting. You can do it. You can. All right, let's talk about some themes in Deuteronomy in this book. There are many, many themes. Let me just give you some. Let's talk first about, number one, the exalted word that's introduced to the world. I don't know if you've thought of it this way, but up to this point on the earth, okay, Israel on the plains of Moab, there had been no written revelation or record of Yahweh anywhere on the planet. The only place on earth to find that revelation of Yahweh was in, going to be in this land of promise. Israel was entrusted with the oracles of God, Romans 3, 2. So how should this nation that's in a covenant relationship with Yahweh, how should they view his word that was written to them? What are they to believe about this word in the revelation of Yahweh? How about first just that this word is unalterable? Go to Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2. We'll start in verse 1. So now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and listen to the judgments which I'm teaching you to do so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from this word. Why? Because there's a purpose he's after that you may keep the commandment of Yahweh, your God, which I'm commanding you. In other words, if you add to it, you're going to thwart your ability to keep it. And if you decide to edit it and take some things out, you are going to thwart your ability, Israel, to keep it. And they needed to understand this is unalterable. This revelation that is coming to you through Moses, don't change it. It's perfect as it is. They needed to understand that the word is sufficient. Look at Deuteronomy chapter chapter 8. It is enough. They don't need anything else. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. The entire commandment that I am commanding you you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which Yahweh swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember all the ways which Yahweh your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. And much later, a faithful servant of Yahweh would go out into the wilderness and for 40 days he would not eat. And there's no mistake with that number 40. And he would be hungry. And then he would be tempted to just provide food, just make bread from this rock. And he quotes this. Because he knows that even if he ate his last meal, that true living only comes from God's word. So God's word was sufficient. They were supposed to believe this and know this as a nation. What else? The the word is available and accessible. Go to chapter 30, verse 11. Chapter 30. This is a crucial theme in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 30, verse 11. This follows on the word of the new covenant coming. Verse 6, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed. This is a corporate work that Yahweh is going to do on Israel one day. 
to love Yahweh your God with all your heart. Drop down to verse 11. For this commandment which I'm commanding you today, it is not too difficult for you, nor is it far from you. It is not in heaven that you should say, well, who's going to go up to heaven for us to get it and make us hear it so that we may do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you would say, who will cross the sea for us and get it for us and make us hear it that we may do it? But the word is very near you in your mouth, in your heart that you may do it. It is available, it is access, accessible, and it's in that land where Israel was going to be and was. And lastly, what should they know? They needed to know the word is life-promoting. Go to chapter 32, verse 46. This is so great. This word is life-promoting. And he said to them, place in your heart all the words with, with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to be careful to do, even all the words of this law, for it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, what do I mean? It's your life. And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. This follows on the heel of Moses' song, where the theme of his song in chapter 32 is apostasy and the judgment that Israel deserves when they um, go astray and apostatize. And the word of God will not stand by in emptiness and just watch that happen. The word will be life for them eventually. So the exalted word gets introduced to the world and it's in a nation and it's on a plot of real estate called the land of Canaan. That leads to the next theme, be careful. So being the nation on earth that's entrusted with God's word, what should they be like with that word? Well, they should be careful regarding their loyalty and faithfulness to Yahweh. We won't look at all of these, but look at chapter four, verse nine again. You'll, you'll see that chapter four is a big one that we keep coming back to over and over. But chapter four, verse nine, let's just see all the different levels of carefulness that they were called to. Chapter four, verse nine, only keep yourself and keep your soul very carefully, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make, known, uh, make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. So your, Israel, your heart leaks it's going to miss these things. They're going to drip out. They're going to come out. Don't lose these things. Um, make sure that you retain them. But not just retain them. You need to advance them even into your children. Chapter 6, verse 24 and 25. Take a look at that. 6, 24. So Yahweh commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Yahweh our God for good, for our good all our days and for our survival as it is today. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before Yahweh our God, just as he commanded us. They were to be careful in their obedience. Go to chapter 17, verse 10. Chapter 17, verse 10. Once they are in the land and they have a difficult case that they need judgment on, um, judgment to be handed down on, they'll go to where that place where the, the tent is, which becomes the temple, and they will ask the Levitical priest to help them and to judge them. And in verse 10, and you shall do according to the terms of the judgment which they declare to you from that place which Yahweh chooses, and you shall be careful to do according to all that they teach you. Once you're in the land and the judgment is passed on the case, whatever you bring there, you better be careful to do it. Don't alter from that and decide you're going to do something different. Chapter 23, verse 23 You shall be careful and do what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to Yahweh your God, that which you spoke with your mouth. They need to be careful with their words, with their vows. One last one, look at 28 verse 1. Just so you can see where carefulness is required on all these different levels. Now it will be, 28.1, if you diligently listen to the voice of Yahweh your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, Yahweh your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. So their carefulness was to help position them to this exalted place above all the other nations. One day they will have that kingdom restored to them, that position. And not all dissimilar from that theme of carefulness is the third one, obey and live in the land. Number three, obey and live in the land. So this exhortation ties the law, ties Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic covenant inseparably to Israel's enjoyment 
of the Abrahamic promises in the land. So the Mosaic covenant becomes this assistant to the, Mos- uh, to the Abrahamic covenant, so to speak. Okay? It doesn't replace the Abrahamic covenant. It doesn't become an authority over it. But it becomes an assistant to help them. What will give Israel the fullest capacity to enjoy the promises and the blessings of Yahweh to Abraham's descendants in the land? What's going to enable them to enjoy that to the fullest? Well, it's being faithful to these words, obeying them and living in the land. Let's go back to Leviticus 18 for just a moment. I want you to see this. Leviticus 18 And we'll see the interconnectivity of the Pentateuch to help you understand this. Leviticus 18, verse 5. We'll even look at verse 4. You are to do my judgments and keep my statutes to walk in them. I am Yahweh your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does them, he shall live by them. I am Yahweh. And the interconnectivity of the Pentateuch helps you understand more of what is being said there. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. So now Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I'm teaching you to do so that you may live. What do you mean? And go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Look down at verse 4. There's a reason why you are alive today, second generation. You are the ones who clung to Yahweh, your God, and you are alive today, every one of you. Look at verse 40 of chapter 4. So you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I'm commanding you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, that you may prolong your days... On the land which Yahweh your God is giving you for all the days. Go to chapter 7, verse 12. Let's look at this one again. Then it will be, chapter 7, verse 12, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that Yahweh your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you, and he will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your new wine, your oil, and increase of your herd and the young of your flock in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There will be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle, and I'll take away all the sickness. So here would have been Israel at the peak of all of the other nations living fully in the land because they were obedient. There'd be no sickness. What a contrast to the indention, indention, what is that? Um, The dent, the, the divot, what do we call that? That Israel was when Jesus came. Demon possession everywhere in Israel. Every possible sickness everywhere. The curse is on them. And they are not at the head, they are at the tail. It's really amazing. So what God wants to put on display, and if there's anything that I could spark a curiosity in you tonight in regards to what's going on in the Pentateuch, and especially Deuteronomy, it would be something like this, that God wants to put on display on a plot of real estate on this earth, not mediocre life being lived out, But fullness of life, the fullness of life that his people are living richly in and they're enjoying it to the fullest because they have long life and they're they're experiencing this blessing in abundance because they're obeying his word. And that leads to the theme of blessings and curses. Number four, these opposite themes occur about 74 or 75 times in Deuteronomy. There's just too many of them to list. You'll find those words occurring that many times. And the unity of the Pentateuch calls the reader to make this connection between blessings within the Pentateuch, to not drive a hard wedge between them. So the blessing of Yahweh, for instance, on creation... In Genesis 1.22 on day 5, and on Genesis 1.28 on day 6, and in Genesis 2.3 on day 7, he blessed the seventh day. That has a relationship to the blessings that Yahweh promises to Israel in the land when they're going to be loyal to him. They're not the same. They're not equal, but they're not unrelated either. 
And the unity of the Pentateuch calls the reader to make this connection between the curses within the Pentateuch to not drive a hard wedge between them either. So the curse that Yahweh pronounced at the entrance of sin into the human race in Genesis 3 and that the succeeding generations felt such that um, a a father says, I'm going to name my son Noah because maybe he'll give us rest from the hard work of the ground that has been cursed. There's... That has a relationship to the curses that Yahweh promises to Israel in the land when they disobey him. It's not equal, but they're not unrelated either. Deuteronomy picks up these opposite themes of blessing and curses extensively and continues the development of them. If Israel is careful to obey Yahweh in the land, you know what they'll do? They will experience their blessing unseen on the world, in the world, since before the fall. There's going to be a plot of real estate, God's telling them, in which it's going to look like the curse has just been pushed back. And you will be living in this blessing. That's stunning. And if they do not obey Yahweh in the land, they will experience a cursing that seems to even surpass the curse that came at the fall. And it's going to be so intensified. And there's chapters devoted to this in Deuteronomy. So again, what is God aiming at for among the nations? Well, with this nation that is in unique relationship to him, the land of promise could become a piece of real estate in the world where the curse would be pushed back to its borders. And that a pre-fall blessing could be restored there. And the nations around them could leave their cursed lands and find the blessing of Yahweh alive and well someplace. How are the families of the earth going to find blessing in Abraham? Come to this land. It's like the curse has been pushed back here. Come here. And so the nations were supposed to converge on this nation that was at the pinnacle of all of them. Let me just give you some examples. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commands, commandments of Yahweh, your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of Yahweh, your God, but turn aside from the way which I'm commanding you today by walking after other gods that you have not known. And it will be when Yahweh your God brings you into the land where you're entering to possess it, put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Go to chapter 23, verse 5. This is interesting. So the nations also have caught on to this blessing and cursing thing because one of the nations hires a false prophet to curse Israel. Do the nations understand that there, there's curse, cursedness everywhere? They do. So Balak hires Balaam. And now watch what God does in chapter 23, verse 5. This is what Moses says. Nevertheless, Yahweh your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, but Yahweh your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because Yahweh your God loves you. So Yahweh loves Israel and says, somebody else wants to curse you? My love will protect you. And I can turn the cursing into a blessing Chapter 27, there are 13 curses. Chapter 28, verse 2, there are about 10 blessings. Chapter 28, verses 15 to 68, there are horrible curses listed. Chapter 30, verse 19, turn there with me. Let's look at that one. Chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, Israel, that I have set before you life. I've set before you death. The blessing and the curse. Choose life that you may live, you and your seed, your offspring. In chapter 33, verses 1 to 29, Moses blesses the 12 tribes. And what is tragic is that the blessing never was fully realized when Israel entered the land with Joshua, and not even when they re-entered the land at the end of the historical section under Zerubbabel, and what God put on display was not a nation that was where, where the curse had been pushed back, but he put on display an intensified curse on a people because they were disobedient to him, such that when Messiah comes the first time, 
There's demon possession everywhere, like I said. There's every possible disease everywhere. All he is doing all day long is just pushing the curse back again. The ultimate fulfillment of this blessing of Yahweh will come when the new covenant takes over corporate Israel. Look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. So it will be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you cause these things to return to your heart in all of the nations where Yahweh your God has banished you. And by the way, this is still even today, even though many of them are in the land. And you return to Yahweh your God and listen to his voice with all your heart and soul and according to all that I'm commanding you today with, all, with you and your sons, then Yahweh your God will return you from captivity and return his compassion on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. If those of you who are banished are at the ends of the sky, from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there he will take you back. And Yahweh your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul, so that you may live. And Yahweh your God will inflict all of these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall return and listen to the voice of Yahweh, and you shall do all his commandments which I am commanding you today. Then Yahweh your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground. For Yahweh will return to rejoice over you for good, Israel, just as he rejoiced over your fathers when you listen to the voice of Yahweh your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, when you return to Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And that day has not yet come for them. And that's not unrelated, the blessing and curses, to the fifth theme of be glad and rejoice. This is everywhere. Listen, this is the lie of sin in my own heart and in yours as well. The lie of sin is this, that gladness of heart can only be found on my terms and when my conditions are met. When I get my conditions met, then I'll be happy. That's the lie of sin within. But true gladness of heart and rejoicing has only ever been found in submission to Yahweh's terms and conditions. That there was to be a nation on earth, Israel, who was to experience that true gladness of heart and rejoicing, unlike anything that the other nations around them could even know. And, and how were they to have that gladness and that rejoicing? Well, Israel's gladness and rejoicing was to be rooted in Yahweh and in his blessing. Let's just look at one example of this, Deuteronomy 12. There's a few verses in Deuteronomy 12 that kind of pull this out. Chapter 12, verse 7. There also you and your household shall eat before Yahweh your God and be glad in all that you send forth your hand to do in which Yahweh your God has blessed you. You're going to be in the land, he's going to bless you, and you're going to put your hand forth to do something, and it's just going to be fruitful, and then you bring it to Yahweh, and you should be really glad. Chapter 12, verse 12, and you shall be glad before Yahweh your God, and you and your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levite who's within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Verse 18, but you shall eat with them Eat them before Yahweh your God in the place which Yahweh your God will choose, you and your son and daughter and your male and female slaves and the Levite who's within your gates, and you shall be glad before Yahweh your God in all that you send forth your hand to do. This was to be the happiest place on earth. You were to be glad. Yahweh wants the nations to see the gladness and joy of living submissively under him. That's what he wanted to put on display. There's the theme of love, number six. You know that it says over and over in Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So just Israel's love for Yahweh. I want you to look at just a couple of Israel's, um, of God's love for Israel. Look at Deuteronomy 5, verse 9. What, what, what occurs in Deuteronomy 5? What's found in Deuteronomy 5? 
It's also found in Exodus 20, 10 Commandments. 5 verse 9, you shall not worship them or serve them, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Could be translated showing loving kindness to the thousandth generation. So here's God's judgment on the third to the fourth generation but showing loving kindness to the thousandth generation. Same thing is said in chapter seven, verses eight and nine, that God loves like this. Um, his love surpasses, and extends. he extends his love into the thousandth generation. He is a God who loves. Go to chapter 23, verse five. Let's look at that to see God's love for Israel. Nevertheless, Yahweh your God was not willing to listen to Balaam, right? Remember this? But Yahweh, your God, turned the curse into a blessing for you. Why? Why did he do that? Well, because Yahweh, your God, loves you, Israel. He loves you. Chapter 33, verse 3. Let's look at that. Indeed, he loves the people. All your holy ones are in your hand. He loves the people. That's foundational, isn't it? That's the foundation under any love that we might have for God. The seventh theme that I want you to be aware of is, is the theme of the heart. The word heart occurs about 51 times um, in the book of Deuteronomy. And we're not going to look at um, any of them tonight, even the two that I put up as a category here. But um, what is the heart? The heart is not a piece of you. It's not a portion of you. Um, it is you, inwardly speaking, before God. It's who you are inwardly before God. And God wants to say about 50 different things that he can in the book of Deuteronomy to Israel about who they are inwardly before him. Here's something you can do throughout your whole book, all, every book of the Bible, but you can do this in Deuteronomy for, for sure. For each usage of the word heart, just find it and circle it in your translation. And then just write a simple one sentence statement, summary statement about what is said about the heart in that verse. And if you have room in your margin to do it, just do it in your margin. And what you're going to do as you do that through the whole Bible is you are going to be building this biblical catalog of tangible categories for how you know how to think about your heart and you can shepherd your heart from those truths. But here are like some of the categories in Deuteronomy. You can be fearful or faint of heart. You can have an obstinate or a hard heart. Uh, you can search for Yahweh with all your heart, love him with all your heart, serve him with all your heart, listen and obey him with all your heart. You can return to Yahweh with all your heart. He says to Israel, you can take Yahweh's uniqueness to your heart, God's expectation for a better and a new heart. We'll look at that in a moment. God's words can be on your heart. There can be internal dialogue within your heart that you're having with yourself there. God tests the heart. You can know God's ways in your heart. You can know the way that he kind of works and you can know that in your heart. The heart can be lifted up in pride. There can be uprightness of heart. The heart can be deceived Desires of the heart are found, um, and worshipful desires of the heart. The heart can be grieved. A heart can be turned away from Yahweh. There can be anger in the heart, bewilderment of heart, gladness of heart, and dread in the heart. And with those kinds of themes and understanding the purpose of Deuteronomy and the Pentateuch, you are armed well and with a growing understanding of it, you're well positioned for the next section of your Old Testament, from Joshua to Esther. Because what's going to happen in those next 12 books is going to cover the rest of the Old Testament period. And you're going to be asking yourself the question, well, how did Israel do in the land? Was his word preeminent among them? Was it, were they careful with it? Were, did they obey it? Was it blessing or was it curse that came? Was there gladness? Were they a glad nation? Were they a people who loved Yahweh? 
Were they a people who were concerned with their hearts, who they were inwardly before them? Did they enjoy the Abrahamic blessing to the fullest? And they did not. Let's talk about the next section, the roots in Deuteronomy. There are roots in Deuteronomy that become fruits elsewhere in the Bible. And this is where I want to help you think a little bit about how these truths that are found in Deuteronomy are going to help you understand the rest of your Bible. When you read about any of these subjects that are going to be on this list, you can see uh, the first one there, a future king in Israel. Um, When you read about any one of these subjects anywhere in the Bible beyond the Pentateuch, the subject has its roots all the way back in the Pentateuch, okay? To have the fullest understanding then of a biblical subject of what's God doing with a king in Israel, you can't ignore the Pentateuch then. You can't ignore Deuteronomy. Um, you know this, this is an illustration. Um, it's difficult to understand a movie if you begin watching it at the halfway point, especially because all of the direction determining events and facts have been happening already, and you don't know them. And this is why you don't start reading any great book by starting at the one-third point or the halfway point. But but why why do we do that with our Bibles so much? We're we're content to not read these first sections and other sections. We're, We're content, and we need to go back to these because the roots, we're missing the roots of where many of these truths begin There's a future king in Israel. It goes all the way back to promise to Abraham and to Sarah. Um, It's found in Deuteronomy in chapter 17. There's extensive um, instruction given to what kings were supposed to do. Um, You find out that there's a place that Yahweh chooses uh, for worship in the land. That didn't happen, and God didn't all of a sudden get an idea when David was dealing with the plague, and he's on um, the mountain, and he sees the angel of the Lord with a sword drawn, and he's slaying um, the Israelites, that's not the first time that came up. Deuteronomy talks, has extensively many verses about the place that Yahweh will choose for his name to dwell. You know this root to fruit theme. There are two or three witnesses. Everything must be confirmed by two or three witnesses. That's not, that, that the first time that came on the scene was not in Matthew 18, right? When Jesus says that in church discipline, you take one or two others with you so that every fact can be confirmed. That goes all the way back to Numbers 35, and it's found in Deuteronomy. There's a promise of a coming prophet like Moses. So when, the, on, when Jesus does come on the scene and, and John the Baptist, and they're asking, are you the prophet? It's one like Moses who's going to come. Israel's future captivity is talked about in the Pentateuch. Their dispersion, their exile, their return to the land of promise. The last days, that phrase, just the last days, is talked about not in the prophets, the major prophets, first. It's talked about way back in Genesis, and then Numbers, and then Deuteronomy picks it up. And then even the New Covenant. Let me just rock you through these real quick. The New Covenant does not have its roots in Jeremiah 31 or Ezekiel 11 or 36, but all the way back in Deuteronomy 5. Look at this. Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments. So here he is, here's Yahweh with his people, and he's just saying there there needs to be a better heart than what they've got. He already knows that. It's not a surprise to him. Chapter 10, verse 16. So circumcise your heart. He just tells them, you need a new heart. Do it. And stiffen your neck no longer. Chapter 29, verse 4. I know you just get to one verse and I'm already turning to another one. I'm so sorry. Yet to this day, Yahweh has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. On the plains of Moab, renewing the, uh, as he's renewing the, the Mosaic covenant with them, Yahweh had not yet given them a new heart. That comes in chapter 30, verse 6. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed. The new covenant is being spoken of there. The Mosaic covenant didn't have built into it the provision for a new heart to be made. If it did, God would have offered it to them in it. But that will take place in the new covenant. All right, so let's wrap this up by doing one thing, one more passage. Let's go to John chapter 15. I want you to just look at our Savior Jesus as we finish this. John 15, 
verse 9. Jesus with his disciples in the last night with them. What do we need to do with this? Number one, just meditate on and marvel at God's love for you in Christ. Look at this. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you, disciples. I have loved you. I've done it according to the standard that is the way that the Father has loved me, which is a pretty high standard, and I love you, disciples, Jesus says. And this is underneath everything in your life, believer. This is under everything. You dig down as far as you can, this needs to be the foundation that Christ loves you. Think about what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. He could have put a period right there. Because it was, and all that's true. But he couldn't stop. Why? Because he was struck that he's the one who loves me. And gave himself up for me. That's the foundation. That's the gospel, Right? And so that is the foundation for our lives. Meditate on that and marvel at that again and again and again. Secondly, never allow yourself then to drift out from under his love. Look at verse 9, the last part. Jesus says, abide in my love. And then he says in verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. The way that you allow yourself to never drift is by putting Jesus' commands in front of you. And what audaciousness for Jesus to say, if you love me, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. That almost sounds like what Yahweh said to, it is what Yahweh said on the plains of Moab. And now Yahweh in the flesh says it to his disciples. We love him and we stay in his love by being obedient to him. And then lastly, proclaim to yourself this truth about where gladness and rejoicing are found. It's never found on your own terms. You will tell yourself that over and over and over. If I could just get this, if, if they would just stop that, if, if things would just go this way, if it, if it didn't happen like that, it would have been, it would have been happier, it would have been better, it, I, would, I could have been glad. But proclaim to yourself the truth about where gladness and rejoicing are truly found. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. I love you, abide in my love, keep my commandments. I've spoken to you so that my joy will be in you and that your joy may be complete. Just like God, Yahweh in the plains of Moab did not want in the land, he didn't want a people had, who had mediocre joy under him. Jesus doesn't want his disciples to have incomplete joy. It needs to be complete. And I've spoken these things to you that you know that you're under my love and now you abide in my love by keeping my commandments and you're going to be really happy people. That's what we're called to. That's the same message from your Old Testament into your new, isn't it? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me, a sinner, thank you for loving us as you have. There is no one like you that you would endure all that you have endured, all of the heinous acts of sin that each one of us commit heaped upon yourself, that you would be willing to take them on yourself at the cross and give yourself up for me, for us, in love is astounding. So, Lord, we just want to stop for a moment and just think that you are Yahweh in the flesh who loves us. That's not a new thought. Uh, the Pentateuch and Deuteronomy in particular revealed you to be Yahweh on the plains of Moab, loving Israel, a people who were just as sinful as me. Thank you for this united theme across the Bible. Thank you for loving us as you do. Lord, would you now help us to abide in your love? Put your commands in front of us. It's, it's appropriate for you to do that when we are completely overwhelmed by your love. And we pray that as your commands are before us, we would not see them as burdensome, but it would be a delight. We would want to put that yoke of Jesus on, which is easy and light because of his great love. He's so gentle. You're so gentle towards us, Christ. 
we would gladly put your yoke on and follow you anywhere. Lord, would you please accomplish that in us? Accomplish it and bring glory to your son's name. And it's in his name we do pray.